Okay, so hey everyone, thanks for joining. Um, I, I'm Mark, I work a bunch on like inference and PyTorch, and I wanted to talk to you about like a really a rapid path you can take to push your models to production. So essentially like training models is hard, you know, it's have to spend a lot of time and a lot of compute, but the inference problem seems a bit simpler. It's pretty much you have a model and you run it over a batch. And that's pretty much like what you need for inference. Um, however, like as you're sort of like going and trying to make this like more real, there's a couple more steps you might need to make. Like, well, you can't like reload your model per inference, so maybe you need to set up an HTTP server once and like make inferences against it. Then you need to load your model weights and your artifacts, and you know that can take forever for large models. Um, you know, us users don't send you tensors; they'll send you text or images, so you might need to pre-process those inputs. You run the inference, so this is like the model, model batch I was talking about. And then you're like, great, I wanna run an inference, but this inference is taking like forever. It's taking a couple of seconds, and like real time is typically less than 10 milliseconds, which is like what a lot of like, users expect from our inferences. So there's still like sort of a, at least like a 10x multiplier. You need to sort of measure this like on an ongoing basis, because you can't wait for your users to actually churn from your application because it's too slow. And eventually you might need to like actually deploy it in some sort of reproducible environment like Docker or Kubernetes. And once you have all of this, then you need to deal with multiprocessing. So you're gonna have eight GPUs, you need to keep all eight of those busy. You have a CPU with like hundreds of cores, you need to keep all of those busy. So how do you do this? So uh, a lot of times like, so, so I work on TorchServe and a lot of times people ask me, well, what's the difference between TorchServe and Fast API? And the answer like I give is like, well, like Fast API does the first four just fine. Like if, all, if this is all you're doing, like don't use TorchServe. However, like if you're really worried about like making the, the inference fast and making it work in multi-process, there's a sort of like a lot of like harder problems that we've solved for you. So I'm gonna talk about those. So at a high level, like our architecture looks like this. Like basically, we, you, ha you have a management API where you can say, hey, I wanna load these models. An inference API where you can say, hey, I wanna make requests versus this model. And this will launch like a couple of like backend workers and those backend workers are essentially Python processes. So this is what I also mentioned at the keynote, like running Python in prod, like this is really what I'm referring to. You're, 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 launching, uh, you're launching Python workers. The rest of the stack is mostly written in Java. And a very frequent question people ask me is like, well, like, isn't Java slow? So to answer this question, this is a, per so this is a flame graph. So you can see here, uh, basically you see that like line to the left? Um, so that's like the framework overhead that we have. So the way to read these graphs, by the way, is like the x-axis isn't time, it's like duration spent because it's a sampling profiler. So okay, so that's like the Java overhead. There's also like a bunch of idle, so what swapper is means like this is like your CPU not doing anything at all. So that's about like 50% of the total runtime in a typical customer model that I take a look at. And then you have like a, another like 50% which is spent in Python land. And so you look at this, well, what do you need to do? Well, one is you need to do more work. And then the other is you just need to write more efficient PyTorch code. So let's talk about both of those things. So in terms of doing more work, like one of the most important optimizations you, you, you have available to you is what's called dynamic batching. So what dynamic batching essentially is, is you say like, hey, I have a batch size of four, but I'm gonna wait at most like 30 milliseconds to get like all three of those elements. And then when the 30 millisecond elapses, you just make a batch with whatever you have available. So you constantly wanna be keeping like your, your, your machines busy. Um, but your user experience, like using like a product like Torch Service, you need to write what's called a handler. And a handler is a Python class that essentially needs to learn how to pre-process your data, run an inference, and then post-process that data back. So fundamentally, you wanna create an inference server in pure Python, like this is, this is sort of the main thing you need to build. Um, so the, the nice thing about this is because it's all pure Python, uh, sort of like the same user experience that we all love with PyTorch works, so you can use something like PDB. And so this is like something my, my colleague Ankit Gunapal like added, so you can like very easily like debug how like your program works and figure out like crashes proactively. Um, so the nice thing about like having like a Pythonic workflow is like some of our customers like Ryan Avery like found it like really easy to iterate quickly because you're not like sort of dependent on having to rewrite your model in a different language to be able to interact with it. Sort of like the same tools you use for local development are the same tools you can use for like deploying something to prod. Um, 
So because like I mentioned that like ultimately half of the typical program time is spent in a slow PyTorch program, one really useful way to debug this is via the PyTorch profiler. So you can enable this with an environment variable. And the way this will work is it'll show you a trace like this. The main thing you wanna look for in a trace like this is if you have, like you see where it says stream seven, so that's your GPU. The main bad thing you wanna look at is you have like many, many small lines. So what this means is that you have individual kernels being dispatched to the GPU, which means no fusions, which means you're not using your GPU and you might as well like be burning money down the drain. Um, so you want those to be like chunky bars. You don't want them to be like these like tiny little lines. So the next thing is that you might think like, well, you know, my model is slow, like what do I do? Well, one way is you write a smaller model, but maybe the smaller model isn't good enough. So how do you reduce latency for models without like changing your model code? So the, the main thing I've been recommending to people is like torch compile. So you can just pretty much like torch compile your model with an inductor. But the nice thing about uh, compile is it has like a backend parameter. So for example, like if you wanna support like torch serve on XLA and TPUs, we just need to change like a single argument. Uh, maybe like Onyx has like better performance characteristics for a specific model that you're looking at. So it's like really easy for you to just like benchmark and see. So this in conjunction with the PyTorch profiler or NVIDIA Insight can help you like really quickly figure out like what actually makes things faster. So a mode I always recommend to people and I recommended it earlier today is like reduce overhead. So CUDA graphs are amazing. They make everything fast. Um, so, you know, use them. So now they finally work with dynamic shapes, so they interact well with like dynamic batching. So this is huge, and this just all recently landed for 2.1, so something I highly, highly recommend. So the other thing is like, well, there, there, there's like a popular class of models. Like, I mean, pe people care about different models like differently. So very popular models have been like transformers. But again, you don't want to necessarily have to change your model to add like faster kernels. So the better transformer API works at the NN module level and will let you sort of swap out like more efficient kernels. And the great thing is like this now can accelerate both like GPU and CPU workloads like more recently in 2.1. So the other thing to keep in mind is that like if you're compiling stuff, there's, a, there's, a, there's an overhead to JITs. And this is not an overhead that we can wish away but you can seriously mitigate it if you use like more caching. So in the case of an inference framework like TorchServe, you're gonna be spawning multiple Python processes. All of these can share the same cache because inference is embarrassingly parallel. So as long as you set these two environment variables in your system, if you can even copy them over onto like multiple nodes, this will like severely reduce your, your like warm start time. So something I highly recommend you do. Uh, just pretty much copy it in your Docker command or something, like nothing fancy here. Um, the, the other thing is like historically in TorchServe, we used to recommend people zip and unzip their models because it could be like a standalone artifact. Unfortunately, zipping Llama 7B takes about like 24 minutes and unzipping it takes about three minutes. And that's just like not acceptable. So we just don't recommend you zip it anymore. So just like pretty much like use folders as is. And then when you're loading the actual weights, like this combination of like meta device initialization with like loading with MMAP, can make it like substantially faster to, to run your models, like about like 10x faster on, on Llama 7B, uh, and it's pretty much like something that should be a default at this point. So the cool thing though about our architecture is that because we can just spawn arbitrary backend workers, those workers don't even have to be Python processes. So for example, like my peers, like Matthias like Reso and Li Ning at AWS have been working on spawning uh, C++ processes for people that are like extremely latency sensitive. So the other thing is like, um, okay, so once you're going from like a single Python process to multiple on CPU, your performance is gonna tank. And so a, a config variable, which I call a magic config, is towards set number of threads equals to one, which a lot of people may have been using in prod. There's a slightly better heuristic, which is you take the number of physical cores and divide them by the number of like workers that you have and it'll give you like something a bit better. And typically the way you can observe, uh, but the problem is like as you add more, add more cores, you're gonna notice that your performance doesn't scale linearly. So I was like really glad that we uh, had like Minjin Cho from Intel ended up joining our team. And so what she did instead was like she noticed, okay, well we have like these threads migrating across like two sockets on a CPU. So it's like, oh, this core is doing a bit of work, then it's moving to another core and moving like back. And so what this ends up looking like 
is you have like a process, it's gonna basically constantly like miss, like do a cache miss. And this can like dramatically slow down your performance. Like I'm talking like five to 10x like times. So the, the key here is that when we're launching Python processes, we wanna make sure that they have a certain affinity to certain processes. And so this is something, again, we enable by default and towards serve as like an environment variable. But what you wanna see then is basically just have like one chunk of your sockets that are like really busy and the other that are doing no work. And this is sort of like the nice view you wanna see in HTOP and, and how you can make sure that the CPU inference is fast. So this has been great because like uh, Naver, for example, has been using these optimizations. Like they had a blog like where they talked about saving like 340K a year in like their like server costs, like using like this like, you know, one, you know, one hidden trick. Uh, PyTorch Geometric also like talks about like similar optimizations for their GNN workloads. So something I highly recommend you check out. So the other thing like we, we talked about a lot is like, well, proactively like measuring the performance of your models. So Nam and Namdan at AWS like recently added like a new metrics API where you can say like, again, you just add some instrumentation to your Python code. You say, what is the kind of metric this is? Is this a counter? Is this a gauge? And then you can get like sort of this like cool sci-fi looking dashboard. So this is for example, a dashboard from the, like the Walmart search team where they've been using like these, they've been using TorchSurf to scale like all of their search. Uh, and it's pretty cool, because like, I mean, Walmart is like one of the biggest like websites in the world. It's like, you know, fun fact, it's like the largest company in the world by revenue, the largest employer in the world. And like for them, like scaling using TorchServe and Python has like worked totally fine and something I'm pretty thrilled about. So at this point, like, I mean, I, I'm just, just to conclude, like I feel fortunate that TorchServe is now like the default way to serve PyTorch models from like SageMaker, Vertex, MLflow, Kubeflow, KServe. And it's been serving like workloads like for Walmart, Naver, and, and also Amazon ads. And you know, despite me being the person here on the microphone, like this is really a collaboration between a lot of like awesome people at Meta, AWS, and more recently Intel. So thank you. I think um, we're gonna have, uh, oh, sorry. <laughs> yeah, sorry, sorry. <laughs> yeah. So I'll be here for two minutes for questions and make sure to hang out for the next talk. Like my colleague Hamid is gonna be coming on stage to talk about how we support large models. Uh, but yeah, if you have any questions, I'll be here or I can just be hanging out here, so. All right, I guess, okay, so, so the question is like, uh, so, so, so you're, you're saying that you would also like to apply these model loading techniques to hugging face models. I guess it's great that we have Zach here, like Zach, we should upstream, yes, like he's thinking in his chair. But like, I think it's probably a good idea to upstream something like this to hugging face and use it by default. It just, it just seems to work. So maybe just a couple of benchmarks and we're good. Yeah. So I was thinking of doing that like tonight. Uh, tonight, okay, yeah, there we are, yeah, yeah. Use, use the nightlies, use the nightlies, yeah. Okay, exciting. All right, well, uh, thank you so much, everyone. We really appreciate your time. <laughs>